<clears throat> Amen. So you're there in John chapter 12, and we are continuing our series or study uh, to expose Calvinism. And so we've already hit uh, three letters of the tulip. So we have we had total depravity, unconditional election, and limited atonement. And now we're getting into the I, which is irresistible grace. Irresistible grace. And so I just want to basically uh, just hit each one of these points. And, uh, you know, I've done whole sermons on this, this subject, uh, dealing with it as far as a whole. But, you know what, each point can take a whole sermon. And obviously, we already see that. But I want to read to you their definition of irresistible grace. And so uh, irresistible grace or effectuous grace is a doctrine in Christian theology, particularly associated with Calvinism, which teaches that the saving grace of God is effectually applied to those whom he has determined to save, in, in, in parentheses, the elect, and in God's timing overcomes their resistance to obeying the call of the gospel, bringing them to faith in Christ. It is to be distinguished from uh, prevenient grace, particularly associated with Arminianism, which teaches that the offer of salvation through grace does not act irresistibly in a purely cause-effect uh, deterministic method, but rather in an influence and response fashion that can be both freely accepted and freely denied. So that's a mouthful, but you know what? Here's the thing. You know what? I don't need to know what, you know, like Calvinism or Arminianism. I need to know what the Bible says on this issue. And the thing is, is that uh, both are wrong. Calvinism's wrong. Arminianism's wrong. Now, Arminianism at least realizes that you have free will and you have the choice of salvation. Where they get it wrong is that you can lose your salvation and that you can give it back. Um, you know, the, you have the free will choice to then, like, uh, not be saved anymore. Uh, sorry, once he says you have everlasting life, now it's on him. And you know what? You, he can't lie. But uh, here's an article that someone sent me. So, um, uh, a gentleman sent me a, a message, and I, 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 I want to say he's in Mexico because he was talking about how he's dealing with this in like a Spanish-speaking Reformed Baptist church. So this is all over the place, okay? Um, but he sent me this message, and, and there was this article, and uh, you probably heard of Irresistible Grace. Uh, and, but notice what it, this article, and just a little excerpt of this article, it says, Common grace is a lower degree of grace than special. The latter succeeds in overcoming the enmity of the carnal mind and the opposition of the sinful will. The former does not succeed, says John Howe, when divine grace is working, but at the common rate. Then it suffers itself oftentimes to be overcome and yields the victory to the contending sinner. Now, what I want to mention here is that none of that is in the Bible. Okay? Irresistible grace isn't mentioned in the Bible. Prevenient grace isn't mentioned in the Bible. Uh, this, this common grace or special grace or saving faith, is none of that is mentioned in the Bible. Okay? So go to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, and this is our memory verse for the week. But I really want you to understand this, is that when it comes to Calvinism or just in a lot of theological realms, okay, you're dealing with you know, a lot of just high-end theological minds, if you will, a lot of it has to do with philosophy. They're philosophizing their doctrine, but they don't use biblical terms. They don't use actually what the Bible teaches. It's not like chapter and verse. Okay? So what they have is they have a problem in the Bible because the Bible says that whosoever will, and the Bible says that he will have all men to be saved, and, and the Bible says a lot of these verses that I've already brought up before. And so what they have to do is they have to construct something to basically make it fit their doctrine. Okay, so they, uh, they construct a philosophy that there's not just grace of God, there's a common grace, and then there's a special grace. There's not just, there's not just one calling, there's, a, there's a, a general call, and then there's an effectual call, right? And they just make up this, this philosophy that is not in the Bible. And so what they're starting off is in a, on a false pretense, okay? The false pretense is based off their false philosophy that there's these two different graces or that there's these two different callings. Now, I've heard the general call and the, the effectual call, that's, and I'm going to get into this, okay? But I've never heard it called the common grace and the special grace, okay? So this article, I, you know, they showed me this. I'm just like, well, they're saying the same thing, right? Uh, but essentially, uh, you know, that's how they get, they're going to get around verses 
that I'm going to show you is that they just pull out this, they made up this philosophy over here, and they're like, we're going to apply it to that verse over here, and this verse over here, and this verse over here. Problem is, your philosophy's wrong. Your philosophy's not biblical. You don't have a Bible verse to show me common grace, special grace, general call, effectual call. You have nothing to show me that. Now, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And notice, in vain deceit after tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And the thing that you have to understand when it comes to not just Calvinism, but I am parking it on Calvinism, but when it comes to a lot of theological type of arguments, when it comes to a lot of just high-end theological uh, discussions, is that they have their own terminology, that they define themselves, and then they take that and then they apply it to the Bible. But you know what a Bible-believing Christian should do? Is compare spiritual things with spiritual. With the Bible with the Bible. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So this is just kind of a preface or an introduction into uh, this irresistible grace. Because, you know, out of all of them, this one is so much more just based off of a, 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 a wrong philosophy. Okay? And, you know, obviously the other ones are too. But this one, literally, they have to make up this philosophy in order to, it's like their key to, to proving their point, okay? But their key is wrong. Their key isn't, isn't found in the Bible. Now, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, notice what it says here. It says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men or man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. You know what? You want to talk about being on an ivory tower and talk about your high-end vocabulary and pontificate about all the, the, the high-end type of words that you know. How about you tell me about the deep things of God in the Bible? Because the Spirit of God is not going to speak of himself, by the way. You know what that, you know what that means? Is that he's not coming up with new things that Jesus didn't already say. He's going to bring to remembrance that which Jesus had already said. So that means that if, if you're going to talk about deep things of God, you better have a Bible verse to back it up. You better be saying, thus saith the Lord, or chapter and verse, as far as why I should even listen to that as far as the deep things of God. Now, keep reading there. Verse 11 says, For what man, what, uh, man knoweth the things of the man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And this is the key. When it comes to defeating Calvinism, when it comes to defeating, defeating any type of uh, these theological arguments against what the Bible teaches as far as eternal security, when it comes to the fact that Jesus died for everybody, or just anything that we've been covering, you need to understand this is that it, need to, it needs to not to be, uh, you know, according to words with man's wisdom teacheth. And you know what? This, this common grace and special grace, those are words which man's wisdom teacheth. You know, the, uh, the general call and the effectual call, that, those are words which man's wisdom teacheth. You know, the idea that, well, he didn't die for everybody because that'd be double jeopardy. That's words which man's wisdom teacheth, not which the Bible teacheth. But you need to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And it says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And you know what? It doesn't surprise me when a lot of these Calvinists don't understand what I'm saying because they're a natural man and they can't discern things that are spiritual. Okay? I'm not saying every single person that calls themselves a Calvinist is unsaved. But there's definitely, if you're on that high end of like this hyper-Calvinism, then you're unsaved. Okay? And I'm going to get to why specifically in the P of Tulip. Because the P of Tulip is where I will separate the sheep from the goats, if you will, <laughs> when it comes to the idea of if you believe that someone has to continue in the word and keep the commandments or they're not saved, then you don't believe it's by grace through faith. That's essentially, you're putting works after salvation just as much as the Arminians, or I'm sorry, the other people are putting works before salvation or works during salvation. Uh, you know what? No, it's works neither, anywhere. You know, it's, it's no works before, no works during, no works after. It's just by faith alone in Jesus Christ, by grace. 
Now, how about this other term that's brought up? Now, I don't have this in an article on my, but this is a term that's used a lot. And this term's used a lot in Baptist churches, in good Baptist churches, okay? Total depravity is used a lot in good Baptist churches that believe right on salvation. But this term right here, sovereign, sovereign. I think it's even in our, uh, one of our songs that we sing, okay? Now, this, this word's not inherently wrong, okay? So don't get me wrong and be like, you know, that word's wicked. They should be struck from the dictionary, okay? But what they do with this word, okay? Let me give you, if you just went to dictionary.com on what the word sovereign means, this is what it means. A monarch, a king, queen, or other supreme ruler. I have no problem with that if you say that Jesus is sovereign because he's the king of kings, okay? Another one is a person who has supreme power or authority. He's not omnipotent. Okay, so he's all-powerful. I'm good with that. A group of people, of persons, or state having sovereign authority. So now it's talking about like a group of people is sovereign over a certain group of people, right? A gold coin of the United Kingdom equal to one pound sterling went out of circulation after 1914. Maybe that's what they mean by it. I don't know. But the thing is, is that sovereign, obviously, do you see anywhere in there where it says sovereign means that, that basically there's no free will of the people that they are ruling over? Because that's their definition. Their definition is that when God, God's sovereign, which means that literally you can't choose to do anything, he is forcing you to do everything. Okay, like he's literally forcing you to make these choices. I mean, look up all the kingdoms in the Bible. Did, did the king, like did the people have free will to make the right choice or the wrong choice or whatever choice they made? They had that choice, but there are consequences to those choices, you know, and the king would punish them accordingly. And whether the king was right or wrong, you know what? He didn't force them to do it. So this idea of sovereign meaning that he's like a puppet master and he's basically forcing people to sin, forcing people to believe, forcing people to not believe, like that is ridiculous and it's found nowhere in the Bible. And so you know what you need to do? You need to get into the word of God. You need to get off this, this, this philosophy of the world and words which man's wisdom teacheth. You know what? That's going to lead to vain deceit. That's going to lead to the rudiments of the world that are not after Christ. And go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And here's the thing, though. When people, like, give these big orations, they, they think, I, I, I'm pretty sure they think that they sound really smart. <laughs> and you know what? I think people do actually think they sound really smart. Because if you got up and you just had this high-end vocabulary and you're just going on this high-end stuff, and most of the people can't even understand what you're saying because you literally, like, wrote your speech out of a, th uh, a thesaurus, you know, to, to make your sound so sound so, like, just intelligent, then, you know what, people may look at you as, as far as you're intelligent, but here's the problem, there's no power in that. Do you want to sound smart or do you want to, or do you want to have power behind what you say? Notice what it says in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Listen, you may say, well, you know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You're like, well, that vocabulary is not too complicated. You know, that doesn't sound like you're just so intelligent when you say it. Yeah, but it's got power. And that's the difference. Because you know what? I don't need to sound intelligent because it's not by the wisdom of men that I'm going to win anybody. And you know what? The, you know what Paul said? He, he, he came to, to the Corinth not knowing anything but Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because the idea is when you're getting something to the gospel, you're not there to flex your intellectual muscles in front of them. You're there to get them saved in the simplicity that's in Christ, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is the difference there. But you know what's interesting is that these same people want to come at you and be like, yeah, you young buck, you know, listen, son, you know, I've been around longer than you, you know, like James White, you know, I wrote my book when you were still in middle school or something like that, or, or whatever, you know, they would try to say. It's like, yeah, but you know what? God's been around way before you've ever been here. You know what? God's from everlasting, and I'm talking about God's word. And when I, when I use the Bible, you know what I'm using? I'm using power. You know what? That, that he had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And you know what? When you have the spirit of God upon you, when you're preaching God's word, or you have the word of God at, your, at the, the tips of, uh, of, your, uh, of your lips there, is the idea is that you've got power coming out of your mouth. 
You know what I have to say to that? Go to verse 13 there. You know, after we're talking about the, the word of God, it says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You know what? God was around before, before James White's mom was wiping snot off his face. Okay? So don't give me this idea. It's like, oh, I'm older than you. You know what? The Bible's older than you. God's older than you, and God's smarter than you, and your wisdom is foolishness to God. Now, that's all a preface because I haven't got into the idea of what we're talking about really here. But, I, you know, when it comes to Calvinism, that is what I see. I see a bunch of people that think they're smart, that think they know, they, that they're so high, and they're like, oh, you, you just don't understand. You don't understand the, the common grace and the special grace. You don't understand the general call and the effectual call. You know, you know why? You know why I don't understand? Because it's not in the Bible. Because I don't need to know stupid things. Okay? I don't look at foolish questions and, and stupid logic you know, that you're bringing up. I'd rather read something else. I'd rather, rather read about the Titanic okay, than read about your stupid philosophy that's not in the Bible. Now, in uh, Matthew chapter 20, go to Matthew chapter 20. I'm going to get into a point here. Because, like I said, when they use this argument of uh, this general call and effectual call, this is how they're going to answer these verses, because they got some problems. Notice what it says in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 16. It says in verse 16, So the last shall be first, and the first last. For many be called, but few chosen. Now, everybody would say that the chosen are the elect, right? I mean, chosen and elect are the, used synonymously, right? If you, you elect a president, you chose a president, or in America's case, uh, they steal the election and no one chose that, right? But the idea here is that many are called, but few are chosen. You know what that's showing you is that there's a lot of people that didn't get chosen that were called, okay? Now, I've already preached a sermon on what it means to be chosen or elect, you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit and obedience to the blood of Jesus Christ. And the idea is that, you know, we're, we're predestined, we're elect, you know, who first trusted in Christ. The idea is that God foreknew who would trust in him and he chose those that would trust in him to be saved and it's by faith, okay? But you know what? He wanted everybody to do that. He was calling everybody to do that. So, Go to uh, Matthew chapter 22, just to show you that, well, is this talking about saved or lost? Is this talking about someone going to hell? Okay, well, go to Matthew chapter 22. I think it's going to be hard to get around this, that this many that are called but not chosen are talking about how there's many people that go to hell. Okay, Many people go to hell, few people go to heaven. And the idea is that someone asked the exact question to Jesus. They said, are there few to be saved? And he says, strive ye to enter in at the straight gate. You know, and in Matthew 7, it says, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. So the answer is yes. There are few saves, and that, that's why this makes sense. Many are called, but few are chosen. Now, if this was talking about, and I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. I'm going to prove this to you that this is definitely talking about heaven and hell. But, uh, but if this was, if, if, for their logic to work, wouldn't this have to say, Few are called and few are chosen, right? Because their idea is that if you're called, you're going to get saved. You know, that's the idea of irresistible grace. If he calls you, you can't resist that, okay? And notice what it says in Matthew 22, verse 11. It says, And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, last I checked, outer darkness is talking about the lake of fire. It's talking about hell. And, you know, this story actually is, is linked to the Battle of Armageddon. Okay? Um, and I've preached on that before, but you're dealing with the marriage supper of the Lamb that happens in Revelation chapter 19. And who is, there actually are two people that are cast into uh, the lake of fire, right in that chapter. It's the beast and the false prophet who are two men that are cast into the lake of fire. And you know what? Uh, this, this many are called, but few are chosen. 
You know, that, you know why this makes sense? Because he wants everybody to get saved. And there's many people from the foundation of the world to, to the end of the world that we, we haven't got to yet that have been called by God. Many people have been called by God. And many doesn't mean that it's not all. But it's just making a point that the quantities, right? The quantity is what's, what's mentioned here. Okay? Because if you said all are called but few are chosen, you don't really know whether there was a lot that were called, right? Right? Because you can could, you could say, well, all is few, right? And so the thing is, is that you're given a quantity of that. Now go to John chapter 12. This is the passage that we read today. And notice what it says here in verse 32. So, like I said, they have to have this false premise of this vain philosophy that says that there's two different types of calling. So what they'll say to this is that, well, yeah, many are called, but that's the general call. That's the general call, but people don't get saved off the general call. So it's a just kidding call. Is that what that is? You know, like God's calling you, but he's like, just kidding. I wasn't really trying to call you. I'm just like making it look like I'm calling you. Let's put it on the bottom shelf here. What would that, why would he be calling them in a general sense, but not in an effectual sense? Because that's what they're trying to say. Now in verse uh, 12, or verse 32 there, it says, and, if, and, and, uh, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now this is Jesus talking about being lifted up it says, as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the idea there is that he's saying, if I be lifted up, just like the serpent was lifted up, because he's talking about how he's going to die. He's going to be lifted up on a cross and be nailed to a cross to die for our sins. And he's saying, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. You say, well, how in the world do they answer that? Okay, well, this is what they say. Well, all there, that's not talking about every single person. That's talking about all kinds of people. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, it is funny, though. Like, it's just how they have to stretch it. They have to stretch that to say, well, it's just all kinds. Over here, that's all the elect. But you know what? Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. You know, don't add to the word of God. It says all. Now, go to John chapter 6, because here's what they're going to say. This is one of their proof texts. Now, I have already hit on this uh, last week, but I'm going to hit on it again. And we'll be going back to John chapter 12, because John chapter 12 actually is going to state something that's being stated here in John 6. Okay. But in verse 41 there, so John 6 verse 41 it says, the Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the, the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he said, I came down from heaven? So these people obviously don't believe. They're saying like Joseph is his father. You know, they're saying, you know, who is this guy? They're murmuring against him. Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the father which hath sent me draw him and I will raise him up at the last day. So, you know what, it, it's interesting because earlier in this passage here, it talks about, you see me and you believe not. And then later on it says, this is the will of him that sent me that everyone would see it the son and believe on him may have everlasting life and I'll raise him up at the last day. So it's not like, God, it's not God's will that you see the son, you know, you don't see the son or, or whatever. But here's the thing though, Nowhere does this, what they're going to say here is that, see, you, you know, the Father doesn't draw everybody. Now, does it say, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of beating this dead horse, okay? But let me just hit this dead horse here. Does it say here that, that, that you know, there, that he doesn't uh, draw everybody? Does it say that? Does it say that God the Father doesn't draw anybody? No, he's stating a fact that unless the Father draws you, you can't come unto me. Fact. Okay. Well, I can say a lot of things. Unless Jesus be lifted up, he can't draw all men unto him. Right? There's a, there's a fact there that unless Jesus dies on the cross, then we're not going to be saved. But it doesn't say that, but he's saying it for a purpose, meaning that I do believe, go, to John, go back to John chapter 12, 
that there can come a point where the Father isn't drawing you, where the Son isn't drawing you, and I say this, where the Holy Ghost isn't drawing you anymore. But here's the problem. The Calvinists believe that that person never had the Father drawing them. That person never had the Son drawing them. That person never had the Holy Ghost uh, draw them. You know, Jesus said, I, you know, the, the light is coming to the world uh, that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I mean, how many verses do you have to say, like, well, that every doesn't mean every single person. It means every type of person. Now, that all doesn't mean all people. That means, like, all types of people, you know? And it, but that's why I said, you know, it wouldn't matter what God put in here. They would talk around it. Because there's so many times where I'm like, how do they get around this? And somehow they'll just wiggle their way and somehow come around what it's saying. Okay. Now, in John chapter 12, now again, John chapter 12, verse 32 and 33, is talking about, it says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he's talking about his death. Notice in verse 34, the people answered him, we have heard out of the law that Christ abideth forever. And how sayest thou, the son of man must be lifted up. Who is this son of man? Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Now, that's a strong statement. I want you to, if, if you don't mind underlying in your Bible, say, underline that. Now, this is true in the, the fact that Jesus obviously wasn't here on the earth, walking on the earth, you know, that long, right? It's just a little while that he was walking on the earth. But this is something a little deeper than that. We're talking about the light. Let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus is still a light in this world? Do you th still think that Jesus is the light of the world? Right? Obviously, he still is. And he was before he even came. But obviously, you know, he was literally here, God in the flesh, walking on the earth. So it says, yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light. So notice he's saying, you have this light for a little while. You know, don't, don't take it for granted, is basically what he's, he's stating here. While ye have the light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and hid and, er, and did hide himself from them. There's something that's being said here, more than the physical aspect of like, hey, he's, he's going to be dying here soon. You know, he's not going to be here physically on the earth anymore. And he physically hid himself from them and like physically went away. How about this? The light that you have in this world to believe on him isn't going to be here forever. You know what? You have the light. While you have the light, you need to believe in that light that you might be the, the children of light. But you know what? There can come a point where Jesus hides himself from you. You know what? He was drawing all men unto him. But there can come a point where he hides himself from you. And you say, is that what this is talking about? Well, read the next verse. In verse 37, But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, because that Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes, and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. So what are you talking about? You're talking about people that are being hardened so that they won't believe. But did they start off that way? I mean, think about this in context. Jesus is saying, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. While you have the light, believe in it. Right? While you have it, believe in it. But, they're basically stating that it's not always going to be there. It's not always going to be there. You're not always going to have the opportunity to believe in the light because that light can be taken away from you. Because he that hath shall be given. But he that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And that's where it's saying that's being, uh, that's being fulfilled there. Because he's given to every man the measure of faith. But there can come a point where that's taken away. He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But there can be a point where that light is taken away. And this is where Calvinists just don't understand. Or they do understand what we're saying. They just don't believe it. Now, like I said, you either have to understand that there's a reprobate doctrine. You know, where people can become, uh, you know, totally depraved to where they, they can't believe. Because what did it say here? They could not believe. Black and white, it says they could not believe. But the question you have to ask yourself, and that's what we're talking about right now, did they, were they born that way or were they made that way later on? And you know what? The Bible's very clear that 
there's people that become that later on. They weren't born to be totally depraved. They weren't born to reject God. God didn't choose them to reject this. But you know what? He did ordain from the foundation of the world that those that believe on him would be saved. He did ordain from the foundation of the world that those that would reject him and reject him and reject him would, would be ordained to basically become some reprobate. That doesn't mean that he chose them to be a reprobate or chose them to salvation. He just knew from the foundation of the world who was going to believe on him. And therefore, he says, that person's going to be saved because they believe on me. And I'm going to predestinate them from the foundation of the world to be conformed to the image of my son and do all these different things. But he also foreknew who would become a reprobate. He also foreknew who would harden themselves to the point where God would harden them, just like Pharaoh. And you know what? That's where people get off the rails. And I can understand why people get into Calvinism. Okay? It's not like I, I'm just like, where are you guys coming at with all this stuff? It's the idea is that how do you answer all these verses? And what they do is they take some, some bad philosophy, some worldly philosophy, and you know, man's traditions to answer it instead of comparing spiritual with spiritual. Because when you're, and you know, obviously I'm doing these contradictions in the Bible or so-called, right? When you're dealing with a so-called contradiction where it says that he wants all people, you know, everyone to be saved, he'll have all to come to repentance, you know, like all these different things that are said there. And then later on, he's stating that, you know what? They can't believe. They're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. What you have to say is that they're both right. They're both right, but how does it make sense? And understanding that people can become that later on, that's how it makes sense. Now, go to Luke chapter 13, Luke chapter 13 and, and verse 34. I'm going to give you some ammunition here. Obviously, I believe John 12 is ammunition, but they're going to talk around it. And honestly, this is why if you're out soul winning and you're trying to give something the gospel, a man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. The idea is that you know what, when you're out soul winning and someone's just like, you show them a verse and they're like, no, but it says this. It means this. And you show them another verse and be like, no, but it means this. And they just don't want to see it. Then you just say, God bless you, have a good day. I'm going on to the next person, right? And just move on. Because it's just not profitable to go down that path. Now, if someone, if they, they're showing you like, yeah, I see that, but what about this passage over here? Okay? And they're, they're kind of agreeing with you. They're, they agree, yeah, you're right about that. But what about this? And then you, you answer that. And what about this? That's not what we're talking about, right? Because people can do that where you're just kind of tearing down these walls and you're answering their questions. You're like, okay, I got that, but what about this? Okay, I got that, but what about this? That's not a heretic, you know? That's just someone that's trying to find the truth and they got a lot of roadblocks, okay? Now, in Luke chapter 13 and verse 34, notice what it says here. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her, her wings, and you would not. Now, according to them, that this irresistible grace means that if God is trying to gather you, then you can't do it. You can't come. You know, I mean, basically, or I'm sorry, you will. You definitely will. Okay? You can't refuse that. So notice this, and I want you to notice this too, that... In the King James Bible, there's not that many exclamation marks. So when I see an exclamation mark in the Bible, there's something very poignant that's being said. Okay, Jesus is talking here, and he's basically saying, I need to go to Jerusalem because it, must, it can't be that a prophet would die outside of Jerusalem. Now, that's tongue-in-cheek, right? He's basically saying, like, you know, I can't die outside of Jerusalem because that's where all the prophets die. Right? That's pretty much what he's saying. But he's saying, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets, and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together? So God is saying here, you know, Jesus is saying here, how often would I have gathered you together? He's basically saying, how often I wanted to gather you together, but you wouldn't do it. What is God's will? What does he want? Does he, does he want to scatter Jerusalem? Does he want to scatter Israel? No. It says that he wanted to often gathered them together, but it says, and they would not. And then he says in verse 35, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, ye shall not see me until the time come when ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So the idea there is that because he called, 
and it was trying to gather you, trying to gather you, trying to gather you, and you would refuse, 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 refuse. He's like, you're left desolate now. But the answer to this, was that just like uh, not an effectual gathering that he was trying to do? Are you telling me that God is not effectual in that gathering? When, he, when he's making this point, he's saying, you know, I often would have gathered you. Well, that was just a general, he was just generally trying to gather. Okay, Go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Now, in this passage, this is a passage where wisdom is personified. Okay? Meaning that wisdom is obviously an attribute, it's not an actual person. But sometimes in the Bible it'll take attributes and personify them as if they're people. Okay? Um, so wisdom is, is referred to as a her. And, it's, and, and, and I preached a sermon on this, you know, dealing with the virtuous woman and wisdom and how the personification of wisdom is basically paralleled with the virtuous woman or the wife of your youth, you know, that type of thing. But that being said is that, he, that wisdom, obviously God is wise and God has his attribute of wisdom. And so this is an attribute. The, the spirit of wisdom is upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and, and Isaiah 11 teaches that. But that being said, I just kind of want to preface it with that, that it's not saying like God is, doing, is saying this, but I believe that essentially God is the one that's saying this, but he's using wisdom personified to get that across. Verse 20 it says, Wisdom crieth for the out, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the, the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, and I will make known my words unto you. So notice that, you know, this wisdom is pouring out the spirit. You know, obviously the spirit of wisdom, all that stuff is true there. But it says in verse 24, Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel, and with none of my reproof, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh, when your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for they will for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. So get this, this is what we're dealing with here, when we're dealing with the fact of, you know, God's obviously calling everybody to get saved, he's drawing everybody to get saved, but there are people that basically he called and they just refused. He stretches out his hands and keep refusing, and he's saying, there, there comes a point that says, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. And that's where you get to the point that they could not believe that the idea is that they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And it says he's going to mock when their fear cometh. He's going to laugh at their calamity. And, you know, that's what we're dealing with there. And the way they're going to get around that, general call. That's a general call. That's not an effectual call. Again, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Go to uh, Romans chapter 9, 9. This is one of the, their favorite places to go to to prove this point. To say that basically no one has resisted his will. So in, uh, so in uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 15. And really what it gets down to, when you're dealing with Calvinism, the fact that we don't have free will, that makes God a very, like, really sinful God. Okay? Because he is forcing people to sin. Now, they don't like saying it. They don't like coming out and saying that, okay? And they'll try to use, like, Joseph, where it says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good kind of thing. Yeah, but that's like saying that, that Joseph's brothers were the good guys, right? You know, Joseph's brothers were, like, doing God's service, you know, by throwing them in a pit and selling them off to Egypt. No, what that means is that God used something that was bad that happened to you for good, right? And... They'll use that type of logic to try to explain pedophilia and say, well, if someone molests a child, yeah, that's God doing it, you know, forcing them to do it, but it, it's, it's providing something good in the end. Give me, you know, lose me with that junk. Or miss me with that junk, or however you want to say it. That, that is wicked. And listen, these hyper-Calvinists have to say that. They have, to, in the end, when you pin them down on that, 
They have to say that God made Judas betray Jesus, that God is forcing people to molest children, that God is forcing people to rape people, God is forcing people to kill people and to murder people. It's wicked. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, crush that here in a minute. Well, actually, I'm going to be hitting that on tonight, um, dealing with what atheists try to say against God. But, uh, but I'm definitely going to be hitting on this. Now, in Romans chapter 9, and verse 15, Romans chapter 9, and verse 15, it says, For he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Now, when you look at this passage, I'm actually, it's, it's interesting how sometimes your daily Bible reading will tie into what you're doing. But I'm in Exodus right now, and I was just going through Exodus 32 and 33, where you deal with them. Uh, they made the golden calf, and you know, basically, these are our gods and all this stuff. And, and Moses is basically pleading with God not to destroy the children of Israel. And this is where this verse comes up. You know, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. And, you know, that is not dealing with people that were born reprobate. You know, like, that's their idea. And the reason that they bring that up is because they're talking about Isaac and, I'm sorry, Esau and Jacob in the womb, which I've already proved is talking about two different nations. When you go back to where it says, when it goes back to the story that the elder shall serve the younger, or even that Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And both those places is talking about two manner of people and two nations are striving in your womb. You know, and that you're dealing with two groups of people, not individual people. So it's not like, you know, God hated Esau in the womb. No, he hated Edom, the nation, before Esau was even born. That's what it's stating. And he loved Israel, the nation, before Jacob was ever born before he was ever surnamed Jacob, or I'm sorry, surnamed Israel. But notice that it says here, and they'll say, well, see, so then it is not of him that willeth. Okay. Now, I haven't heard them say this because I try not to, like, pollute my ears with so much Calvinist garbage that I just want to shoot myself. But the idea is that him that willeth, I can imagine what they're going to try to say with this, is that, well, that means that he doesn't have free will. So it's not a it's not of the person that's will, you know, their free will choice to believe. Now, let's look at a, a parallel passage dealing with, uh, you know, will and salvation, okay? Look at John chapter 1, John chapter 1 and verse 12. John chapter 1 and verse 12, and I'm going to show you what he's talking about here because he just got done saying that it's not of, that it should be not by works, but of, you know, uh, but of him that calleth, right? The purpose of him that calleth. So he's basically stating that, you know, he didn't choose you know, basically based off of works, okay? He doesn't choose people to get saved based off works. He doesn't choose to have mercy on people because of their works. No, salvation is by faith, not by works, okay? And it's not by the will of man. It's not by the will of the person, okay? And I'm going to show you what that means. Now, in, in John chapter 1, and they'll use this passage too because they just misquote everything or take everything out of context. Verse 12, it says, but as Many as received him, to the end gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Great verse. Salvation, to become a child of God, to be born again, is by what? Faith. You're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. But you know what it's not by? It says, uh, believe, which were born. So talking about being born of God. Not of blood. So it's not by your genealogy. It's not by who your dad was or your mom was or anything like that. So it's not by blood that you're saved. <clears throat> nor by the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So what's being talked about here is basically saying that you're born, by, you're born of God by faith. But you're not born by blood, you're not born by the will of the flesh, or the will of, God, or will of man, but by God. And what it's talking about is that it's not by your own willpower that you're saved. And I kind of talked about this with, uh, in Colossians 2, it talks about, uh, you know, this... Uh, voluntary humility to angels and this will to worship and all this stuff but the idea is that you know your willpower to keep the commandments is not how you're saved your will over your flesh is not how you're going to be saved okay that's what he's stating but it's your belief it's your faith that saves you okay so but go to Acts chapter i'm sorry uh, go back to Romans chapter 9 that's not really the the main point that i wanted to get to in Romans chapter 9 um that they're going to bring up, but I, I just wanted to kind of nip that in the bud, that when it says, not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, okay? So notice that those are coupled together, and that 
it's not ba it's not based off what this person does, you know, as far as you know, they're reigning in their will or their will to keep the commandments or or they're running after the commandments or just whatever the case may be. He just got done saying it's not by works, but of him that calleth. And notice what it says in verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. So it's really showing you why God hardened Pharaoh's heart. You know, this explains it, because you may ask yourself, well, why does he turn people into reprobates? Well, this passage actually explains it. Okay, is the idea that he did it so that he might show his power and that his name might be declared throughout all the earth. And you know why I know that happened? Because Rahab the harlot said that we've heard of it when they went into Jericho. And I believe throughout all the known world at that time where there were people around, they heard about what happened in Egypt. They heard about what happened with the Red Sea. And you know why that happened? Because Pharaoh hardened his heart. He wouldn't have to part the Red Sea if Pharaoh would have just stopped by, you know, when the firstborn was killed. But in verse 18, it says, Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he harden it. So he's basically stating here that he hardened Pharaoh's heart. And that's written, obviously, in Exodus. You can read that for yourself. Verse 19, it says, Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he, he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Now, people will say, Well, see, people can't resist his will. Now, you should never base your doctrine off a question. You should base it off a statement, okay? It's just like, uh, you know, faith without, you know, uh, can faith save him? You know, talking about faith without works is dead. What profit, you know, does a man, you know, basically the idea is that you shouldn't base it off a question. And so here it's saying, for who hath resisted his will? And in verse 20, he doesn't even answer it, okay? Notice that he, he doesn't even answer it. He's like, no, that's not a yes or no question, okay? Like, if I asked you, you know, who has resisted God's will, and, and, and then you said no, you know, it's kind of like when someone asks you, like, do you want ice cream, or do you want cake, and, you're, and you say yes, okay? Now, we know what you mean. You mean that I want both, right? But at the same time, like, if you said no, you know, like, it just doesn't make sense. You're asking a question that has a particular answer to it, and yet it's not a yes or no question. So when he says nay, he's shutting them down. He's shutting down the question because he's making a point that, you know, God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. And he'll, have, he'll harden who he'll, he'll harden. And then they're, he's basically saying, but some people are going to say this. You know, some people say, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we live off that one too? You know, that Paul says in Romans, he says, God forbid. In this, in this case, he just shuts it down. And he says, oh man, how are... Who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now, the question I have to ask here is, does it say that he made this vessel unto dishonor in the womb? That's what they want you to think, is that this is from the womb he made this vessel unto dishonor. Nowhere does it say that. Where do I see baby Pharaoh hardening his heart? Okay, where do we pick up with Pharaoh's life when he's an adult, right? He's king. It's not talking about baby Pharaoh like being hardened from the womb. Okay, the example that we have here is Pharaoh as an adult, and it's saying that he's fitting that, that vessel onto dishonor. Notice in verse 22, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he had to call, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So the point that he's making here is not that he like fitted these people from the womb or anything like that. He's basically saying, you may ask your question, why are there reprobates alive right now? Why doesn't he just kill them all? Why does he even make people reprobate? Well, he made, he, he hardened Pharaoh's heart so that his name, that God's name would be uh, you know, spoken throughout the whole world about what he did to Pharaoh. Okay? And he's pointing out a point that the reason that he has long suffering with these vessels of wrath fitted for destruction, talking about reprobates, the reason that he has long suffering, meaning that he doesn't just kill them now, is because he's going to use them to 
uh, basically show his glory. And basically, he's showing his glory through their destruction. Okay? And that's why the wheat and the tares, why when God, you know, when they, the, the, the enemy came in at night and sowed tares among the wheat, and they said, should we pull them up? And he said, don't do it unless you pull up the wheat with the tares. Let them both grow together, and at the end of the world, then you'll separate the wheat from the tares. Okay? Because there's a bigger picture that you don't see. Because if you were looking at Pharaoh's story, you'd be like, why don't you just kill him, kill all the Egyptians, and just take him out of there, right? That would be that my answer, right? Just annihilate him. But then Rahab the harlot wouldn't have heard of these great exploits that were done by Moses and the children of Israel and God when he did all these miracles. Okay, you don't always see the big picture that, hey, it's not just about you, right? It's actually about everybody. It's actually, actually, God is not willing that any should perish. Actually, he'll have all men to be saved, and he's doing everything he can to get as many people saved as possible, and that those that will believe on him, you know, and, but notice what it says in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. I'm almost done, but you say, well, has anyone resisted his will? Well, that's silly. I mean, first of all, because have you read the Bible? <laughs> right? I mean, good night. Read through the Old Testament and tell me no one is resisting God's will. I mean, it's just constantly over and over. Read the book of Judges. Read the book of First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. I mean, just over and over again, them resisting what God and the prophets are saying unto them. You know, like, do this, they don't do it. Do this, they don't do it, and they have to get punished. And then they get right with God, they come back in, and then he's like, if you do this, you're going to be prosperous, I'll take care of you. They do it for a little while, then they fall off the wagon, and then they, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that happens all the time. And, and Stephen, who was full of the Holy Ghost, by the way, when he said this, in verse 51, Acts chapter 7, verse 51, it says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost, as your fathers did, so do ye. So put that in your Calvinist pipe and smoke it. I mean, the idea is that, you know what, he's not only saying that you're doing this right now, but your fathers did too, right? Your fathers did in the wilderness. The whole point that he's getting up to here is that they were in the wilderness, they had King Saul, they had King David, they're going through the whole history of Israel, right? From Abraham to when, you know, basically down to the kings, and he's stating that you do always resist the Holy Ghost. They did it. You're doing it. It's the same thing. And so to say that and no one resists God's will, that's insanity. And it's not biblical. Now, let's end with this. Romans, or, sorry, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. And, I, you know, I, I could go down through the list of all these uh, passages on free will, but I've already done that, and I don't want to beat that horse again. But the Bible is very clear that, that we have our own voluntary will, we have our own free will, and just over and over again the Bible teaches on this. And the doctrine of irresistible grace, it has, that doctrine has to be there because they've already stated that no one can actually even believe. Right? So that means... There has to be unconditional election because God has to choose who he's going to save because no one can believe. But then, how are those people going to believe, you know, since they can't believe because they're totally depraved? Well, that means that he's going to, it's going to be irresistible. They don't even have a choice. They can't help but believe, right? That's what they're stating. And to get around all the verses, they have to basically say there's two different types of graces. There's two different types of callings. No. There's, there's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God over all and, and in you all and through you all. You know, the idea is that, no, it's one calling. One calling. There's not the general call and effectual call, the, the common grace and special grace, just made up stuff. Okay. Now, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16, I just want to read the last few, uh, few verses here, or last six verses of, uh, Revelation. And you know what? James White probably doesn't like it, and the Calvinists probably don't like it because they like their ESV, and, and they're going to say, well, you know, Erasmus didn't have the last six verses in his, uh, his, uh, his Greek uh, edition. You know, he had to pull it from the, the Latin Vulgate. So you're going to tell me that these verses, yeah, they, they don't even have the last half chapter of Mark in there, in Mark 16, in their, in their 
their texts. And if you pin them down on it, they would say it shouldn't be there. They'll say that the woman that committed adultery, that was found committing adultery, where, where you know, Jesus was writing in the sand, that story shouldn't be there. And there's a lot of other places that shouldn't be there because it wasn't found in their text. Well, you know what? It should be there. And you know what? It was, it was there when, when, they penned it, when John penned it down on Patmos. And you know what? I'm going to read it. And notice what it says here in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 16. It says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. So you may ask your question, well, you know, it says that the father draws and, and that the son, you know, if, if he be lifted up, he'll draw all men unto me. But does the spirit draw? Well, here's, here's case in point. It says that the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You know what? If, if people want to take away or add to this, Let's see what God says about that in the next two verses. This is how the Bible ends, by the way. It's saying, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. It is not uh, forced upon you, and it's everybody, whosoever. Notice what it says in verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man take, shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come, I come quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. That's how the Bible ends. He says, whosoever will, let him take up the water of life freely. And by the way, if you add to this or take away from this, I'm going to add the plagues unto you, and I'm going to make it to where you can't even get saved. Okay, because obviously he's not talking about a saved person here. He's talking about an unsaved person that's going to take away from the word of God. And you say, well, do you think a lot of these people that wrote, you know, that, that made these new versions of the Bible, that they're reprobate? Yeah, that's exactly what I think. And people that perpetuate that, knowing what they know, they're not ignorant on the issue. Obviously, people can be ignorant on the issue, right? I'm not saying people can't make mistakes and not like and leave out a word or something like that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people that actually try to corrupt the word of God and knowingly do it. And you know what? A lot of these people are Calvinist. A lot of these people are Arminian. A lot of these people are Orthodox. A lot of these people are Catholics. And some of these people are Baptists. And there might actually be a lot of those in there, too. And you know what? We should be very careful that we're not adding to the Word of God and we're not taking away from the Word of God because there are, you know, big punishments. And here's the thing. You know, obviously, as a saved person, I can't lose my salvation. But at the same time, you know what? There's still going to be harsh punishments if I knowingly am saying something that's not true or if I'm twisting the Word of God. You know what? We need to take that very seriously. And when I preach these sermons to you, I'm not doing this lightly. I'm not just, you know, saying, well, you know what, see if it sticks. No, this is something I've studied out for a long time. And you know what? Test me on it. Test me on any of these points and see if you could take it down. And here's the thing. I'm open. You know, let me know what you got. But it seems like every single time I hear another argument when it comes to Calvinism, it's the same argument packaged a different way. You know, it's like that, that article they gave to me. It's like, yeah, I've never heard of common grace and, a, and a special grace, but it's the same as general call and effectual call. It's just packaged a different way. Instead of the calling, it's talking about grace, you know? And so it's, it's the same thing done over and over again. But here's the thing. God's grace is sufficient. God died for everybody. His grace would cover, you know, it says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God's grace will cover everybody's sins in this entire world from Adam to whoever is born to the very end. His, listen, his blood would have covered the Antichrist's sins. His blood would have covered Judas' sins. He died for all of them. And his grace is obviously sufficient for all, but it's not irresistible to the point where you can't help but choose it. No, you have to make that choice. 
now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. You know, you have to make that choice. You've got to pull the trigger. You have to call upon the name of the Lord. You have to put your faith in Christ. And that is a personal decision that you have to make. And you know what? To take that away, you know what this does? It puts a big, wet blanket on soul winning. And so you can have the hyper-Calvinists that aren't saved, but then you have the people that are just diving into this and be like, well, I can see their points. You know what that makes? It makes uh, what happens there? People are like, well, why do we need to go out soul winning? I mean, these people are going to get saved, right? You know, who God chose, I mean, they, they can't, they're going to get saved, right? So why should we go out and preach the gospel to every creature? Now, their argument is, well, we're, we're, we still should go and, and all that. Where's the motivation when you know that, hey, whatever God wills is going to happen? And, you know, it, it just it gets into the snowball that there's a reason why this doctrine comes up. The reason that this doctrine comes up is because of laziness. Laziness that they don't want to work, so they have to find a reason to prove why they don't need to go out soul winning, why they don't need to go preach the gospel. You know, why, why soul winning doesn't work, right? Oh, you know, they can't get saved just off of uh, hearing a, a short presentation of the gospel. Well, tell that to Peter and all the apostles and everybody that preached to people in one day and got 5,000 people saved, got 3,000 people saved. They didn't have to have a week Bible study for that, did they? Tell that to Jesus, who like literally was just talking to somebody and says, hey, you know what? I see your faith. Your sins are forgiven you. I mean, they were in the house. I mean, I don't think they stayed there that long, especially since there were so many people there they couldn't even get in. I would get claustrophobic. That's not probably the term for it, but whatever the term is where people are in the crowds. You know, the idea is that salvation is something that doesn't take that long. It takes as long as when Peter's preaching it to Cornelius that before he's even done speaking, he was saved. So, you know what? You can say that soul winning doesn't work, but we get people saved every single week. You can say soul winning doesn't work, but you know what? We see the fruit from that. And yes, there's, there's going to be false converts. There always is. Okay? There's always going to be people that say they believe and don't believe. But that's not our job to just make sure that every single person we talk to is sincere on everything that they say. Our job is to give them the gospel, give them the choice to make, choose life or death, choose heaven or hell, choose eternal life or eternal damnation. And, you know, that's our job. But don't give me this irresistible grace stuff because that's not true. It's just not true. It's not what the Bible teaches. Nowhere does it say that. And perseverance of the saints is the next one we're going to do, the last one we're going to do. And this one is the trickiest. This is the one where they're going to say, well, you guys definitely believe in that, right? Because you believe in eternal security. Nope. That's different. Eternal security of the believer is different from perseverance of the saints. And this is probably, the, if you're going to listen to any of these sermons, I, I really want you to listen to the next one that I preach because this is the trickiest one where they're going to try to slide in there to say that they believe it's by grace through faith when it's not really that. Okay. And this is probably the most heretical one because it's teaching work salvation. So, um, but that's irresistible grace exposed. Let's end with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for your word and thank you for uh, your grace, Lord. And thank you for loving us and, and, and obviously uh, doing everything that you could to get us the gospel. And, and Lord, uh, just thank you for that, that salvation that you provided for us. And Lord, we just, uh, just pray that you be with us throughout uh, the rest of the day. I pray that you be with us as we go out soul winning. And Lord, lead us to people that are just ready to hear it, that are wanting to hear the gospel. And Lord, that, uh, that you've been working on. And, and Lord, just pray that you uh, uh, help us see many saved. And Lord, we love you. I pray also in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.